This podcast is a High Act production. Hello, and welcome to this first episode of the Hydrogen Integration for Accelerated Energy Transitions podcast. In this pilot episode, we'll be introducing High Act with a brief overview of who we are and what we're doing. We'll also be discussing communities and how they will benefit from High Act and the hydrogen energy transition. Before we begin, though, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers and the High Act podcast production team. So I'm Sarah Walker. I'm Professor of Energy at Newcastle University, and I'm the director of the Hub on Hydrogen Integration for Accelerated Energy Transitions. I'm Professor Karen Henwood. Um, I work in the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University, and I'm a long-standing uh, member of the Understanding Risk Group, um, as well as having specialist interests myself in social science methodology. Uh, I'm Dan Massey. I'm a research project administrator on the um, High Act and Supergen projects here at Newcastle University. And I'm Rhiannon Lamb, project administrator also from Newcastle University, working on the High Act Hub. And I'm Dr. Jamie Blanche of the University of Glasgow. Uh, I'm a PDRA and I've been working on the consultation phase with stakeholders for High Act. So to start us off, I shall ask, what is the High Act project? I'll put that to Sarah first. Okay, so the High Act project is a hub that um, is hopefully going to be funded by EPSRC, which is one of the research councils. Um, with some funding also from ESRC, which is another funding council. So the idea behind the hub is that it's a combination of development of a kind of community of interest alongside a group of researchers doing a research programme as well. And our focus is on hydrogen integration for accelerated energy transitions, which is what the acronym HI ACT stands for. So we're really interested in how hydrogen fits into the bigger picture and how it can contribute to um, our targets around net zero. Great. Excellent. Do you want me to you want, do you want me to follow on from that? Yeah, or should go I for just it. respond to you, Jamie? Yeah. Please do. Okay, so um yeah, my interest in and high act is um it's really a sort of flows on naturally from work I've been doing for the last seven years here in Cardiff as part of a social science engineering consortium called Flexis or Flexible Integrated Energy Systems. Um, Professor Zhang Zong Wu in um, engineering, who's a sort of pioneer really for thinking about whole systems, um, energy change and um, technical transitions at a whole systems level that involve multi-vectors, which includes hydrogen. So um, I've always sort of assumed that if we're working on whole energy systems change as social scientists, hydrogen was in there somewhere. Um, so this is an opportunity to to really think about think 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 that through with a consortium of people who are more specialists in the hydrogen field, and to to really take forward this idea of hydrogen integration, which um, really caught my attention, and I thought it was a, a good platform for for taking forward research, and and application as well, yeah innovation and application as well, building on research. Um, I suppose that's another one of my key interests really is how research can provide that sort of necessary understanding and um, you know agile, agile platforms for thinking and practice that um, runs alongside technical innovation really. Excellent, thank you, thank you. So how long has the HIAC project been running and what has been done so far? So we were set up with some funding in April of 2022. And since then, we've been working with the community of stakeholders to identify what the research priorities are moving forward. So we've had a number of engagement events with stakeholders. Sometimes this has been one to one, sometimes in small groups. And we've had an online survey and we've had some larger workshop events in order to talk to our community about what their burning research priorities are. And uh, following on from that, then 
We developed a consortium of researchers interested in working together in this space, and we've developed a program of research that incorporates and reflects on those priorities that our stakeholders have told us about, um, but also that enables us to, as Karen said, take forward some of the research that we were already doing and to build on uh, the research base that's already there by way of whole energy systems thinking and um, work around the potential role of hydrogen. So to, to develop that understanding further. Um, so we've developed a proposal that's gone into the funding council now for review and uh, we're just awaiting the outcome of that. So that's where we're up to. Yes, yeah, so um I found it really um, very intriguing and um, quite challenging to be working on the, the proposal. I think, um, Sarah and colleagues, you may be very used to working in this sort of way. It was a very, very creative process and very intensive for two days when we were putting together the proposal. Um, I mean, it wasn't all, well, not all the work was done in two days. I, I understand, Sarah, you had a lot of, of work to do um, subsequently to, to put it all together and put together a very ambitious and timely um, set of work pra work packages. Um, so I'm I'm really keen to be working as part of the whole whole hub, but also really specialising a good deal on the social and political aspects of hydrogen integration. Um, and that's where the community side of things I think really comes into play, because governance you know if governance is a matter for for governments. It's something that's done through policy making and, and policy delivery. But from my point of view, um, that's really best understood when you, you have communities and the impacts of, of government and policy making really brought centre stage um, by thinking about its impacts on communities and people's everyday lives and how they live in the places. And, in, and give, given the sorts of challenges people are, are living with in their everyday lives, um, I think that that brings a new complexion, really, to thinking about questions around governance. Excellent. Thank you. So in terms of, I mean, obviously, we're talking about the outreach to communities. Uh, why is the HIAC project important and how will that benefit communities? So one thing that we wanted to do as part of HIAC is to better understand the potential role that hydrogen might play um, by way of contribution to industry, to domestic homeowners, to the way that we move around from a transport point of view. And as part of the work, we wanted to recognise that those different stakeholder groups, including community and individuals, that they really needed to be able to have a voice in the process. So we wanted to ensure that the scenarios that we were investigating from a technical viewpoint had some input and reflection from those different societal um, frameworks or viewpoints or perspectives. And so that's why it's so important to have colleagues like Karen on the team who um, really can help us investigate and better understand those community perspectives. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for that. There's a, a lot of interest um, at the moment within the broader social science community um, in the sorts of methodologies that can be developed to do precisely what Sarah is talking about, um, to, to work um, with uh, create and work with these sorts of frameworks that can enable com communities to benefit from the changes that are you know happening at lots of different levels in involving industry um, and governments and uh, providers of energy um, so that's a, an area where it's often called um, research into public engagement I think it goes far more than that. We do need to engage publics in the issue, but we also need to um, engage the issues and, and those who are responsible for um, changing the energy energy system and um, the ways in which we produce and, and consume the goods that we all benefit from in a way which um, takes account of, of communities and the sorts of challenges that sort of 
um, don't really want to use the word triple trickle down, but it, it's very easy, isn't it, to sort of split off um, our understandings into different levels um, and talk about multi at multiple levels as if that solves the problem. But actually, it's going beyond um, this idea that we're 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 dealing with hydrogen integration and energy systems change at different levels and we, we need need to integrate between those levels and that's where I think we need different frameworks for thinking and so I'd consider myself part of a wider community of um, social scientists who are trying to do that um, but it's a it's a very interesting and agile space and there are a lot of opportunities here to do to re, to do some really intriguing academically as well as policy focused and solutions focused work. So the work that um, we've been doing um, here in Cardiff, but it's it's no it's not simply something that's done in Cardiff and South Wales, but I think we do bring a particular sort of place based perspective with us because of the particular um, history of industrialization and deindustrialization and reindustrialization in this place. Um, we have been developing particular kinds of workshops where we've been enabling members of the public to come together in community settings um, to understand the sorts of expert visions that um, otherwise they wouldn't be aware of and to start to think about how those visions might unfold in the place where people live. And in that way, to you know, to cut through the different levels um, and to enable expert visions to be brought in alongside um, community based um, perspectives. Um, and in that way, we've come up with this idea that um, one of the ways in which um, communities could benefit from you know, something that could potentially be very disruptive as we power our homes <laughs> and decarbonize our, our systems, um, they could benefit if um, if there's there's a sense that something of public value is coming out of this transformation, out of this transition. So we're, we're sort of talking about this idea that we can um, approach hydrogen integration by thinking about the public value of, of the things that people have um, in the places where they live. Thank you. So with communities, engagement is a two way street. So how can communities help? And what resources may be available for communities to learn more? I think um, this is quite this is quite a difficult question because it's mm. it's very tempting to say, oh well, this is how we've developed particular materials and resources that we use in the workshops, and um, you know, so that we're we are able to engage members of the community in something that otherwise they wouldn't be thinking about. Um, Maybe the more general way of answering this is to say that there is a there is a high level of awareness now amongst members of the public that climate change is a is a real issue that is no longer something that's um, a long way off. It's now become something that's connected to people's lives. Um, and I think this is what thinking about the way that our energy systems are changing um, and how our powers, our homes are going to be powered, for example, is changing. Um, and how organisations, industry and other organisations are having to change because we're going to produce energy um, in decarbonised ways is one way for people to really grapple with the impacts of climate change. And I think at the moment that's 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 an opportunity really and possibly quite a good thing because otherwise you can become very anxious. I, my background is as a psychologist and you know, anxiety is something that can be generated where you don't really know what you're facing and you know it's something's there, but you're not quite sure what it is. So I think, you know, with these sorts of um, activities that we're going to be undertaking as part of High Act, it's an opportunity really to to enable people to engage with the climate change challenge, although we're, we're very likely not going to talk about climate change with them very much at all. And I would say from my perspective, Jamie, is that um, energy touches so much of what we do on a day to day basis. It's needed for us to be able to move around. It's needed for the goods and services that we use. It's um, needed to keep our homes warm and lit. And so from that point of view, um, the ways in which communities can participate is perhaps by being more thoughtful and ref 
reflective on the ways in which energy provides the things that we need. We don't need energy, but we need the things that energy provides us with. And so are there different ways of doing those same things that could be um, less energy intensive, that could still offer the same services to us? Um, and in the same way that um, electricity was a relatively new thing in the early 1900s, now hydrogen is a relatively new thing. Um, just like mobile phones were a relatively new thing in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, then, um, you know, we're, we're seeing technology transition changing the way that we work and live all the time. And so in some ways we're used to change, um, but this energy transition is something that does need to happen quickly and will impact on a very broad um, range of how we live and work. And so community engagement and having open conversations and being willing to think about doing things differently really helps the research. And so we're keen to have those conversations. Yeah, just to um, follow up a little bit on that. Uh, it is amazing, you know, thinking back on the time that I've been doing research on on energy transitions um, and the sorts of impacts and implications this has for, um, you know, the, the societies we live in um, and the communities that um, we inhabit, how, how fast the change has happened. Um, back in 2010, I started a, a project a four year project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council called Energy Biographies. And at that time, we were designing um, activities to enable people to reflect on their uses of energy in their homes, in the places where they lived, as they traveled around about. Um, we had a, a case study in a London hospital so that we were considering um, a large scale organization as well. And we included as another um, community case site, Lamas Eco Village, uh, where, we were, where we were studying um, people who had moved from living in ordinary homes to um, land based livelihoods um, where they had to build their own homes, produce their own energy, grow their own food, um, a hugely challenging undertaking. But at that time, when we started, it was commonplace for us to say, well, we just have to develop new methodologies because people just don't think about their energy practices. It's not something we do. We don't think about swinging, switching on the light switch. That was 2010. How different it is today. So when I when I teach my students today and talk about this project, um, it is quite astounding, really, about how that everyday practice, that mundane everyday practice that had previously been invisible to us, has very rapidly become something that is a uh, something to be reflected on um, without even needing to develop specialist social science methodologies. At the time when we, we were developing those methodologies, it was a very important debate, debate to be had, really, because there was an assumption that people couldn't talk about their practices. These were the sorts of practices that were so routine that you just didn't think about them. They weren't available to consciousness. And the work we did was building on the work of, of other colleagues to, to suggest that, no, actually, it is possible um, to engage people in thinking about their practices in all sorts of intriguing and important ways, which enabled, enabled us to understand how change, changes can be very impactful um, and how people can reflect on them, too. I think it's probably quite important for us to, you know, to talk about one of the other major changes um, in the sorts of resources we have available to us as we undertake, hopefully, our High Act consor consortium research, um, we, we we have been talking, you know, quite a lot about technical transitions and social transitions and um, involving communities in in um, in a research and innovation. But there's a lot of interest now in making this transition in, in a just way, um, and to um, really foregrounding uh, questions about um, you know, the spatial distributions of benefit, um, how you know people um, might be 
um, less disadvantaged by by changes um, which could potentially be very disadvantaged because we're talking about price increases um, and, and for some who are you know less capable of um, uh, dealing with shocks uh, are less yeah. resilient because they don't have quite the resources to bring to bear to, yeah. to be resilient yeah. when systems are changing you know there are there are very um, a lot of very challenging questions to be answered about how the energy the the hydrogen integration into the energy system can be done in a just way and I think I get a sense from across the whole of the HIAC consortium which includes the, the modelers who are doing the, the sort of technical and economic modeling um, right across the spectrum through the those who are working on the the cyber physical um, aspects of um, hydrogen integration there's a lot of interest in this idea that this is a, this is hopefully going to be a just transition, but that's also going to be something challenging to achieve because it always is. And I would just add that there's opportunity for us to um, have these um, community engagements with different um, groups of publics, um, because sometimes we use the term public. Um, but we don't always mean the general public. Uh, there are different stakeholder groups or different publics that we would want to talk to. So there's a, a broad interest in engagement across the hub um, for the purposes of doing research with um, our stakeholder groups and co-creating, not just doing on <laughs> our stakeholder groups. But there's also a flexible fund as part of the hydrogen hub. And so there's opportunity for us to work with different stakeholder groups and community groups to identify further research questions in collaboration and to work collaboratively moving forward. So we have um, a defined research programme currently, but with flexibility to develop new research questions and new collaborations moving forward. So there's flexibility and a bit of agility there as we hopefully see some of these changes start to happen during the lifetime of the project for us to adjust and learn and renew our, our research questions with the community moving forward. Yeah, and that's... Um... That issue is the diversity, the questions about diversity that are built into the HIAC proposal. I think there, there, are, there are lots of ways in which that's going to happen. Um, maybe not all at once. Um, I think it's poss it, it's a risk to be too over ambitious, but we do have a very strong commitment to um, community involvement in this programme um, across different regions, across different places. And so while we're likely to, to start off in particular places, the idea is that there is going to be a regional place based um, aspect of this research, which is quite fundamental to the design. But how it rolls out, how it unfolds, I think it's going to have to be an emergent process um, and to make sure that we can you know, build on the early stages of research and develop um, insights and findings and um, you know, uses of our research um, that can be cumulative. Does anyone else have any thoughts or questions that we could approach? Yeah, um, just would love to say like what a, what a great conversation has been to listen to. Um, Karen, my background is psychology. I did psychology at uni. Um, so it's great to hear like another social scientist and really the talk about how the two areas intersect each other. I found really interesting. I'd be interested to know how you find applying that kind of background to a more technical project like HIACT. Yeah, um, I think it's becoming in, it's becoming easier. You know, there was a time where I was always, you know, slightly nervous about um, being positioned as a, a researcher who was bringing in a lot of irrelevances. Um, you know, as if it was possible to approach, you know, technical changes. Um, keeping people at a distance, but that's no longer the case. I think there's just an assumption now that you know technologists and engineers and you know people who are, are working on the technical side of things are not are not going to be able to be successful unless unless they engage fully with other professionals, mm. um, other domains of work, where the people side of things is um, is just as important, really. And that's certainly 
um, you know, something that um, I've found is it's getting much easier. Um, it, it hasn't gone away. I've still, I think there are still silo. There is some silo thinking out there, and maybe mm. some um, concern of, of not taking on too much. Um, but no, increasingly, I'm finding that psychologists and psychological thinking is is valued. Um, you know, there are concepts now um, which didn't used to be ones that I would come across in this field about mindset, you know, mindset change. Um, can we continue with the same mindset? Now, I don't think that's the kind of question that you can really approach without having psychologists involved. Um, also, people who are um, able to study popular culture um, popular how popular culture changes as, as well. So I think there are opportunities really for us to work as a, a consortium in ways that don't see psychology and understanding popular ca- culture as a barrier. There will be challenges, um, but I do think there are opportunities now to um, overcome the, those silos, ways of working. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think aspects around engineering design has really started to embrace some more reflective thinking on the need of the user in the engineering design space and a great example that always sticks with me is talking to Professor Nicola Pearsall who at the time was doing some work evaluating Um, some photovoltaic field trials and so she was going around different houses and talking to the occupants about how they found their photovoltaic trial and she was talking to this um, lady who was let's say slightly older about uh, her um, photovoltaic installation and the the meter and so on and the meter had been put relatively high up in a location that she just physically couldn't read because she had limited mobility and and couldn't get up high enough to to read the meter and something as simple as that aspect of the design process hadn't been thought by the engineers and sometimes there's a danger that we assume if people aren't using the technology that they're just uh, they just need more information or education yeah. when in fact it's the the fundamental design of the system or the technology that isn't quite right for the end user it's it's not the end user it's the technology um and so it's it's become much more embedded in the way that we think about technology and engineering to really get that um, end user experience more informed by the end user need in the first place, but also to think about not just that single end user, but the whole supply chain of um, technology design, technology uh, manufacture, all the supply chains that go around that, the business models that go around that, as well as the end user experience. And so much of that is informed by a multidisciplinary approach and in fact a interdisciplinary approach so it's not just lots of disciplines working on it but they need to work together to come up with solutions that are going to be more effective in the long term. And, and on that point I would just share um, that in the techno-economic um, way of thinking of, often assumes that um, there are barriers to be overcome which, of course, is you know a generic um, issue that um, I, I wouldn't disagree with. But then I think we need to think about how barriers are being assumed, what, what kind of assumptions are being made about where the barriers lie. And it's often the, it's often assumed that the barriers lie with the, the people, that somehow um, if we're going to change technological systems, then we need to bring people along with us as if they're not really prepared to come along with us. Well, Um, The work that we've been doing on um, low carbon homes, where there's an expert vision that has now become developed to the stage where these homes have been built and people have 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 moved into low carbon homes, um, where they're being asked to to use energy um, in a very different way. And so their practices are having to change around laundry drying and all sorts of mundane things are changing. These are new kinds of homes. 
Um, but I think we've probably surprised um, the our expert expert colleagues with how far people are on board with wanting to live well in these homes that you know these are exciting homes they're they're not um they don't really need to be brought on board with them until such a time as the design features let them down and then it is a that's a different matter so you know where there's a lot of promise built into technology design it's really important that it doesn't fall short and and leave um leave the users of the technology, you know, un unable to do things that they routinely have to do in their everyday lives, such as washing their clothes or drying their clothes. You asked earlier, what are some of the things that we've already been doing? And we have been working with some community organisations. So Community Energy Scotland, Community Energy Wales and National Energy Action have been working with us on um, some community engagement work to enable us through them to better understand some perceptions of the potential for hydrogen. And so um, those organisations have experience of, of doing public engagement and outreach, and they've been really helping us frame some of the questions and evaluate some of the public perceptions of uh, hydrogen as a potential future um, energy type. And um, we've engaged with those organisations in particular because we wanted, through them, to get some understanding across all four nations of the UK. So National Energy Action covers England and Northern Ireland. And then more obviously, Community Energy Scotland is Scotland, Community Energy Wales is Wales. And so it's been very important for us to not forget um, those four different perspectives because um, there's a different context to each of those in terms of energy history, in terms of energy resource availability and also in terms of the governance process and the extent to which energy has become a devolved matter for local governments in those four parts of the UK. So their involvement has been really helpful in identifying some of those research questions very much from a um, a bottom-up community perspective, using those organisations to help us reach out and hear voices that otherwise uh, would perhaps be a little bit more difficult for us to um, to uh, reach out to and hear. No, I absolutely agree that there are many actors and, and voices and organisations that um, are very uh, very capable and actively involved in doing supportive work um, within communities. And in the devolved administration that I have most um, contact with, the Welsh Government, um, that the Welsh Government is very supportive of trying to develop networks where different actors and organisations do come together um, to share their, their knowledge. Um, and that's something that um, has had a, a lot of focus recently on questions around fuel poverty, the cost of living crisis, dealing with you know, sort of the emergency of the, you know, the cost of, of heating homes. Um, so there, there are occasions where you know bec you become mobilised around a very particular issue. But more broadly speaking, I, I, I would say that you know there are there are ways of, um, of engaging regionally that are being fostered, bringing these sort of actors together. Um, so in a meeting recently that I, I was I was attending, it also included um, you know a new organisation called Net Zero Industry Wales. So as well as um, you know talking to um, those organisations that are dealing with um, consumers or citizens who are who are struggling with you know current energy crises, um, we're also dealing very directly with organisations that are dealing with the the challenges of of net zero. Um, for the way that industry um, is fueled, that you know the powering of industry and the challenges of um, having to move to decarbonised um, systems and you know move away from using fossil fuels in the most hard to reach of, of organisations, you know, such as the, the steel industry in Wales.
so I think there are there are real opportunities at the moment for us to be to be working collaboratively with all sorts of organisations. Um, yes, and 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 certainly National Energy Action. We've 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 certainly been working with them on the the fuel poverty issue. I think what's important is for us to recognise that the energy transition is uh, is quite a big challenge. It needs to happen fairly quickly. And it's going to touch on all aspects of the economy. Um, But this is therefore a real opportunity for us to do something different, which is potentially better. So instead of just thinking, how can we do what we're currently doing with a different type of fuel? We could be saying, how can we do what we're doing better? And to take this opportunity to strengthen our economy, to be more resilient, to have an energy system that truly delivers what's needed by way of services and to, yeah, to wipe the slate clean in some ways. And and think if we were starting from scratch um, with the changes that we need to make and the end point that we need to get to. How can we do that in a way that really makes a positive difference to our quality of life? Yeah, I don't think I have a a huge amount to add to that um, other than to say, yes, I absolutely agree with it. And I think if we can bring that ethos, um, that that, that sort of set of concerns and perspective into the engagements that we do have across the board with different organisations and community groups, then I think that's puts us on a very firm footing, a very sound footing um, to, to, to generate the sorts of understandings, new understandings that we will need to support the sorts of changes that will need to happen. I do think we do have to be careful about not promising too much and not promising false dawns. And um, there are there are some very fascinating treaties that will be very well known to many of you here and by Lauren Berlant um, about the problem of cruel optimism. Um, so I think what um, Sarah's describing is a is a much more secure um, and agile platform for approaching all of these sorts of engagements that we need to have than em- you know empty promises really. I'd like to thank you both, uh, Sarah and Karen, for your time today, and to the Hayek production team, Rhiannon and Dan, and to you, the audience, for accessing this podcast. Stay tuned for more soon.